This is Religion and Theology, a podcast from the Center for Theology and Religious Studies. The next four episodes is in collaboration with HT Samtal and their producer Martin de Grell and will bring us past lectures from honorary doctors from the Joint Faculties of Humanities and Theology. And first out is Dr. Paula Fredriksen, honorary doctor of 2017. I'm Martin de Grell. This is the fifth part in our ongoing series about the 2017 honorary doctors at the Faculties of Humanities and Theology. And we are about to hear a lecture by Professor Paula Fredriksen. Paula Fredriksen is Distinguished Visiting Professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She was made honorary doctor at the Faculty of Theology as recognition of the high international standard of her research in religious studies. Professor Fredriksen's research is characterized by an explicit inter- and multidisciplinary perspective. Her research is thus linked to several successful subjects at the Faculty of Theology in Lund, New Testament studies, patristics, Jewish studies, and general history of religion, just to name a few. Her interest in Paul the Apostle and Augustine the Church Father is a common thread throughout her research. From her thesis, Augustine's early interpretations of Paul in 1979 and onward. Fredriksen has also written about Jesus as an historical figure and the early Jesus movement as a branch of Judaism at the time and furthermore has sought to spread her research results to the general public. Professor Fredriksen's lecture entitled Paul, Augustine and Christer on the introspective conscience of the West was recorded at Lux on June 1st, 2017. Thank you. Dear colleagues, thank you for coming. I thank the university and particularly my, my, new, my new colleagues in the new department that I am now newly a member of. Um, and I'm, I'm honored and thrilled to be here. I also, uh, as you might guess from my name, um, I'm part of the Scandinavian diaspora um, in North America. Uh, but since I am American, it means, of course, that I'll deliver the lecture in English. In 1963, in the Harvard Theological Review, Christer Stendhal published his renowned essay, the Apostle Paul and the Introspective Conscience of the West. Some eight years later, as a 20-year-old college undergraduate with a double concentration in religious studies and in history, I read it. I remember thinking at the time it was pretty good. As things turned out, though, Christer's essay was more than pretty good. It has had an impact on the study of Paul out of all proportion to its length. Christer opened his essay by insisting that ancient people be allowed to be genuinely distant and different from us. More to the point, he urged that Paul not be modernized into some historically costumed version of ourselves. People living in different historical epochs, he asserted, are not all essentially the same. This sounds so commonsensical now. But 1963 was the heyday of psychohistory. Eric Erickson's Young Man Luther, published in 1958, was on every college reading list. Ids, egos, and superegos, guilt and desire, impulse and suppression, the hydraulics of Freudian personality structure were presumed to be universally operative across all cultures and time periods. So for Christer in 1963 to challenge this all but universal presupposition about timeless humanity took both imagination and intellectual courage. What Christer asserted 
was nothing else than a principled stand against anachronism, the naive narcissism of projecting ourselves into everywhere else that we look. Christer's call to think critically and historically subsequently resounded in a formative way in the work of E.P. Sanders. Sanders' great book, Paul and Palestinian Judaism, fundamentally altered the terms of New Testament scholarship. It placed Paul emphatically within his own first century Jewish context, and Sanders especially unmasked the Christian anti-Judaism that has blighted so much New Testament scholarship, and especially the scholarship on Paul. Both aspects of Sanders' work cohered closely with Christer's own project and owed much to it. But this article of Christer's made three further points. First, Christer insisted upon what he called Paul's robust conscience, as, for example, when Paul says that as to righteousness under the law, he was blameless or perfect in Philippians 3. Second, Paul's transformation from persecutor to apostle, Christer urged, should be seen not as a conversion so much as a prophetic call or a commission. These two insights, first articulated by Johannes Munch, had a huge exegetical impact. Together, they dethroned Romans 7 as the premier self-description of an apostle tormented by his own sinfulness. Luther might have thought of himself and of every man as simul justus et peccator. Paul, said Christer, suffered no such self-esteem issues. No tortured, introspective conscience wore him down. As the focus on Romans 7 shifted, so too did reconstructions of Paul's signature theological teaching, bringing us to Christer's third point. Romans, he argued, was not a theological exploration of the idea of justification by faith. Rather, Romans addressed the question of how Christ-following Gentiles, ex-pagan pagans, were to be included in the impending redemption of Israel. Romans' theme, as Christer said elsewhere, was missiology and not theology. This reframing of Romans also delivered an exegetical payload. It relocated the letter's center of gravity away from the tormented I of Romans 7 and toward the symphonic eschatology of Romans 9 to 11. Or as Christer put it, Romans 9 to 11 is not an appendix to chapters 1 through 8, but the climax of the letter. For me, as things turned out, however. The most important part of Christer's article was not his recasting of Paul's temperament, nor was it his emphasis on eschatology, about which I'll say more later on. Nor was it his assertion that Paul did not convert, that is, he did not move from one religion, Judaism, to another religion, Christianity, once he received his apostolic call. Nor was it his insistence that justification by faith was Luther's issue, not Paul's. No, what mattered most for me was the intuition that flashed fleetingly between pages 204 and 205. How did Luther's Paul get to be Luther's Paul? asked Christer. And he answered, through the work of Augustine of Hippo. Augustine's confessions, said Christer, put together the West's idea of the introspective self and served as its conduit. Quote, the confessions are the first great document in the history of the introspective conscience, he asserted. And I'm still quoting him here. The Augustinian line leads into the Middle Ages and reaches its climax in the penitential struggle of the Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, and in his interpretation of Paul. Augustine's Paul shaped and, in a sense, caused Luther's Paul, the Paul of Romans 7. It was a brilliant association of ideas. But was it true? Augustine had been born in 354. He died in 430 
in late Roman North Africa, the Bible Belt of Latin Christianity. Luther was born in 1483 and died in 1546. Over 1,000 years stood between Augustine and Luther. And Luther the monk lived in a resoundingly different culture, the penitential, post-medieval, Renaissance culture of 16th century Northern Europe. Augustine's Paul must have been different from Luther's Paul. To start with, the two men were not even reading the same Pauline text. Luther read Paul in Greek. Augustine read Paul in a miserable Latin translation. If Augustine had read Greek, the West might have been spared the doctrine of original sin. Christer and Erickson pretty much convinced me that Luther suffered from a punishing introspective conscience. But with more than 10 centuries separating the late empire from Luther's Europe, could Augustine really have experienced the same? And where underneath all of these multiple Pauline personae, the Paul of Augustine, the Paul of Luther, the Paul of Harvard Divinity School in the 1960s, the Paul of Christer, where was Paul the Jew, the Paul of history? If Schweitzer could quest for the historical Jesus, I decided, then surely I could quest for the historical Paul and the historical Augustine. These twinned quests, it turned out, took me a little longer than my two remaining years of college. It took a little longer than my postgraduate year studying theology at Oxford. They took longer than my five years of doctoral work at Princeton, where I studied the two Romans commentaries that Augustine composed just before he wrote his confessions. In 1982, I published the text and translation of these two commentaries, Augustine on Romans. And this August, at least according to Amazon, I will publish Paul, the pagan's apostle. These two quests, one for Augustine, one for Paul, describe a major trajectory of the past 35 years of my academic life. I hold Christer responsible. Christer's 16-page article, not that I knew it at the time, of course, would set the parameters for what much of my own work. Inspired by his insights, I have always studied Paul within two contexts, that of the mid-first century and that of the Latin West the apocalyptic, charismatic Paul of late Second Temple Judaism, and Augustine's Paul, the Christian theologian of grace, of predestination, and of original sin. Along the way, I have discovered that it took Augustine a while to come up with Augustine's Paul. And the key to Augustine's Paul, it turned out, was not the confessions. Nor is the confessions, as Christer had claimed, quote, the first great document in the history of the introspective conscience. The key to Augustine's Lutheran Paul is Augustine's anti-Pelagian old age. The confessions, yes, marks a stage along the way, but its introspection is not the haunted, critical self-examination of late medieval penitential practices. It is the calm inner gazing of late Roman Neoplatonism. Let me turn to Augustine for a moment then as we work our way back to Paul. Augustine spent the formative 10 years of his young adult life, roughly from ages 19 to 29, as an active and full-hearted heretic. The Paul whom he met in those years was the anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic Paul of the Manichees, a Paul who condemned unelevating Jewish scriptures, the carnal Jewish law, and above all, the bloodthirsty Jewish God, the flawed maker of this flawed universe. Then at around age 30, climbing the professional ladder, Augustine made his way from Carthage to Milan. It was there that he returned to Catholic Christianity. More than a decade later, Augustine described the events surrounding that time in his great theological masterwork, The Confessions. Between his conversion in 386 and his description of it in 397 lay a period of intensive study of Paul 
and particularly of Romans. Augustine bangs his head repeatedly against Romans 9. Why did God love Jacob? Why did he hate Aesop? Why does God punish the sinner if God himself shapes the clay? At stake was not the plight of man the sinner. At stake was a morally coherent construction of God, the God truly represented in Jewish scripture, the God who gave the law, the God who made the universe and everything in it and saw that it was good. And no less at stake was finding an anti manichaean Paul. By the year 400, Augustine found the Catholic Paul. This Paul arrived in tandem with the Catholic Augustine, who was also presented and even constructed in the Confessions. This was not an accident. The Confessions. We all know how the story goes. Augustine was beaten as a schoolboy. He stole pears as a teenager. He came to Carthage, burning, burning, where a cauldron of unholy lust slept and boiled about his flesh. Who hasn't had a freshman year like this? He had a freshman year from hell. He joined the Manichees. He acquired a live-in girlfriend, whom he got pregnant. And he changed faculties from law to philosophy. Poor Monica. But then Augustine became disillusioned with the Manichees. He moved to Milan, he listened to Ambrose, and he read the books of the Platonists. Through late Platonism, Augustine reconceives the problem of evil. Evil is not something, as the Manichees had taught. Evil is no thing, the absence of something, the absence of good, just as cold as the absence of heat. God creates, which means what God creates is good. Evil erodes the good like rust erodes steel. But evil does not invade the good because evil is not good and not being. In other words, God creates everything, but not even God can create no thing. This is Augustine's account written in 397 in the Confessions of how he was thinking about things pre-conversion in cosmopolitan Milan in the mid-380s. He offers not an introspective self so much as a retrospective self. So much for cosmic evil. But what about personal, voluntary evil, also known as sin? In the works that immediately followed his conversion back in 386, writing to other learned gentlemen in his Platonic reading group, Augustine had characterized sin as a mistake made due to ignorance. Once you know the right thing to do, you do the right thing. Any philosopher knows this to be the case. If you know the good, you choose it. But back in Africa, he had to speak before a much less cosmopolitan audience. He publicly debated with the Manichees, who peppered him with quotations from Paul's letter that seemed to talk about unwilled sin, as at Romans 7. Augustine's fancy Neoplatonism wasn't working, whether to persuade his audience or to pummel his enemies. In the mid-390s, he started to study seriously the Catholic Paul. The Catholic Paul in the 4th century was better published than is the Paul of 21st century critical New Testament scholarship. Only seven letters in the canon are currently uncontested. Those are 1 Thessalonians, Philemon, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, and Romans. Augustine painted his portrait of Paul from a richer palette than included the Deuteropauline letters, 2 Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Ephesians, Colossians. And unlike us, he could draw uncritically on the Acts of the Apostles. In the mid-390s then, commenting on Romans and on Galatians, Augustine begins to construct a Paul who was, in the words of Titus chapter 3, verse 3, foolish, disobedient, led astray, slavishly serving various passions and pleasures. End of quote. This is a Paul who did not want to stop sinning, 
but God chose him anyway, against Saul's own will. Thus, Augustine, in 396, immediately before starting the Confessions, commenting on Romans 9, observed, and I'm quoting him here in the Ad Simplicianum, What did Saul do but attack, seize, blind, and slay Christians? What a fierce, savage, blind will was that! Yet he was thrown prostrate by one word from on high, and a vision came to him whereby his mind and will were turned from their fierceness and set on the right way toward faith, so that suddenly, from a marvelous persecutor of the gospel, a more marvelous preacher was made. What then shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. This is Paul as the archetypical convert. He serves as the template for Augustine's presentation of himself in the Confessions. Augustine, too, in Book 8 is, as Paul described himself in the Epistle to Titus, foolish, disobedient, led astray, slavishly serving various passions and pleasures. Augustine explores the terrible emotional and moral paralysis of wanting and not wanting the exact same thing at the exact same time. This is the literary perch for his great prayer, Da mihi castitatem, said noli modo, O God, grant me chastity, but not yet. A child's voice mysteriously chants, Tole, lege, pick up and read. He seizes a copy of Paul's letters and happily lands upon Romans 13, 14, quote, make no provision for the flesh and its appetites. Augustine's will is instantaneously healed. Book 9. Augustine and his household are baptized. Monica dies. Having framed his story through a complex set of allusions to the divided self of Romans 7, Augustine heads back to North Africa, baptized and celibate, a changed man. But wait, there's more. In fact, I've just summed up only the first nine books of Augustine's Confessions. The Confessions continues for four more long, complex books. 40% of its 80,000 Latin words still remain. Rich discussions of memory, of time, of divine revelation, of text and truth and biblical interpretation. Who writes an autobiography that spends its second half on the first verses of the first chapter of Genesis? Here, then, is a problem with looking at the Confessions as a type of introspective autobiography that sheds light on Luther, which is what Christer in 1963 had done. The Confessions is not an autobiography. It is a brilliant Catholic inflection of late Roman pagan Neoplatonism on the nature of man, of the cosmos, and of God. Augustine transposes pagan philosophy into a Pauline key. Not since Philo of Alexandria had Jews and Greeks, the Bible and Plato, been brought into such intimate contact. And it's all happening in bad Latin editions. Augustine reads and speaks only his native language. It's not the least American thing about him. The question that drove Augustine's story all along was not... How can a sinful man find a gracious God? The question, rather, was, how can a time-bound, imperfect human being know the timeless, perfect God? Augustine answers, through the mind. God's image in us, because God has planted in each soul the desire to know him. But, but humans after Adam are adrift in time, unlike God, We have no immediate perfect knowledge. To know anything, we have to interpret. And in an infinitely interpretable universe, what certainty can we ever have? Only such certainty as God imparts to us, says Augustine, as God had done for Augustine at the end of Book 8 of the Confessions. The Confessions, in short, is not a book about Augustine. It's a book about God and about how we can know God. Excuse me, Augustine mobilizes his life story in 397 in order to illustrate his theological point. 
Augustine argues throughout the Confessions that the soul, or more exactly the mind, that highest part of the soul, is the royal road back to God. As we transcend levels of human consciousness, we move metaphysically through the universe, back to the non-material eternal God, the source both of the soul and of the universe. This is not self-critical, penitential introspection. It is platonic introspection, where the architecture of the soul sympathetically resonates with the architecture of the cosmos. In a sense, within this Neoplatonic system, we touch eternity by thinking about it. The Christian twist introduced by Augustine into this system is about the will. Divided against itself, the will cannot will effectively. The good that I want to do, I do not do, and the evil that I do not want to do, this is what I do. A person can will to turn to God effectively, says Augustine, only if God heals the will, turning the person back to God. Romans 7 is Paul's description of an anguished every man before the reception of grace. How then do we get from Augustine's Paul to Luther's Paul? Here we have to flash forward some two decades into the thick of Augustine's battle with Pelagius. Pelagius had held that God's grace strengthens man's goodwill so that aided by grace, he does what is right. And Pelagius cited Augustine's two earlier Romans commentaries to support his own case. Furious. Augustine countered that man always needs God's help, even after the reception of grace. No one has any merit on his own. Even one's own good works after conversion are also the work of God. Augustine proves his point by appealing to Romans 7, which he now interprets in an anti-Pelagian way. The tormented eye of Romans 7, he insists, is not just every man before the reception of grace. The eye of Romans 7, Augustine insists, is the Christian Paul, the Paul even after his conversion. The voice of Romans 7, says the anti-Pelagian Augustine, is the voice of Paul who, although Christian, still continues to be torn between flesh and spirit, between spirit and flesh. Augustine's anti-Pelagian Paul the Paul of the dark 420s, is the Paul who approximates Luther's similiustus et peccator. This Paul was not the product of the confessions. He was not the offshoot of Augustine's own introspective consciousness. This Paul is the strategic brainchild of Augustine's toxic rhetoric against Pelagius. If even the sainted apostle after his conversion still struggled against the flesh, then clearly Pelagius must be wrong, which means Augustine must be right. The will, even sub gratia, is never, ever free. In the long run, it was Augustine's use of his idea of Paul's conversion to frame his own conversion and vice versa, Augustine's use of his own conversion, as he saw it in 397, to understand Paul's, that had the greatest effect on Western tradition. Paul stands in Western tradition as the prototype of the Christian convert, the great sinner redeemed from the error of his earlier life by a single dramatic moment of conversion. This idea, in turn, foregrounds Romans 7, as the apostle's self-confession, his ab- abrupt transfer from sin, works righteousness, or in short, Judaism, to justification through faith in Christ, Gentile Christianity. And it cast a long shadow, passing from Augustine through Luther to Reformation Protestant theology and thence to modern New Testament scholarship. Three great Scandinavian scholars, mid-20th century, significantly challenged this reconstruction of Christian origins. Johannes Munch, Niels Dahl, and Christoph Stendhal. 
Munch leads the list with his 1954 publication, Paul and the Salvation of Mankind, in English. The then prevailing Tübingen school had pitted Judaism against Christianity and a conservative law observant Jewish Christianity of Peter and of James against Paul's law free gospel. On the contrary, asserted Munch. All of the apostles and Paul as well were convinced that they stood at the edge of the end of time between Christ's resurrection and his imminent second coming. Eschatology gave rise to mission. The earliest community saw the gospel message as entirely contiguous with the faith of Israel and the promise of God's redemption to his people. At the end, all Israel, that is ethnic Israel, is saved. Munch's argument shifted Roman center of gravity away from chapter 7 and toward chapters 9 through 11. What then of Paul the convert? Munch urged as well that Paul's Damascus experience be seen not as a conversion, but as Paul's reception of his prophetic call. Paul's own description of his experience in Galatians 1.15 echoes the language of Isaiah and of Jeremiah. Paul's apostleship in Paul's own view, insisted Munch, began with the commission, not with the conversion. The work of Niels Dahl and of Christer Stendhal variously reinforced Munch's arguments. While Dahl held that conversion was the term appropriate for Paul's life-changing experience, he also emphasized that conversion should not connote a change of religion. Paul and his fellow apostles, Dahl insisted, remained committed to the eschatological redemption of Israel, and it was to this end that Paul engaged in his mission to Gentiles. In this reading, no less than in Munch's, Romans 9 to 11, with its conviction that all Israel will be saved, sets the plumb line for Pauline interpretation. Stendhal, meanwhile, as we have seen, built upon Munch and also championed call over conversion. Guilt did not explain Paul's gospel, Christer insisted. Quote, Paul was equipped with what must be called a robust conscience. We look in vain for a statement in which Paul would speak about himself as an actual sinner. That's Christer. Paul saw his mission and the message of the gospel as finding a place for the nations within Israel's coming redemption. Thus, for Stendhal too, Romans 9 through 11 is the climax of the letter. I wish that I could tell you that the work of these three men forever after changed Pauline studies. But that would not be true. The field is still as energetically divided as ever. Many scholars still refer to Paul's call as his conversion. Some will even insist, despite Munch and before him the definitive 1929 study of Kummel, that Romans 7 is confessional, Paul's own self-report. Other scholars, noting that Paul's addressees are predominantly, if not exclusively, Gentile, suggest that Paul taught, quote, two paths of salvation, Torah for Jews and Christ for Gentiles. And still other scholars remain resolutely supersessionist. For them, Paul really did leave an inferior religion, that is Judaism, and a law that he knew was a curse, for a superior religion, law-free Christianity. The two most recent defenses of this very traditional view from 2013 and from 2015 are each very, very long. The one from 2013 is over 1,660 pages, and I had to review it, so I read 1,660 pages of this stuff. Maybe the length is a good thing because it signals that the position itself is getting harder and harder to defend. I number among those scholars who think that Paul and his gospel are best interpreted within Judaism. Paul did not know that his letters would one day be used to create what we call Christianity. Three reasons for thinking this way have already been provided by Munch, Dahl, and Stendhal. First, 
Paul thought of his becoming an apostle as a prophetic call rather than as a conversion. Second, Paul himself had a robust Jewish identity. And third, Paul expected the return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the transformation of the living, and the establishment of God's kingdom within his own lifetime. It is history that looks at the apostles as the church's founding generation. They looked at themselves as history's final generation. Fittingly, it is on this last point, eschatology, that I and Christer will end. So many things disturb undergraduates in courses introducing the New Testament. They read Matthew and Luke together for the first time and realize that those two Gospels tell two very different birth narratives. They find out that none of the 12 disciples in Mark's Gospel ever understood a word that Jesus was saying. They find out that there are four different stories about the resurrection. They find out that Paul teaches the resurrection of a spiritual body. They find out that Mark's Jesus cleanses the temple at the very end of his mission, but that John's Jesus does the very same thing at the very beginning of his. Some of these things bother some of them. Other things bother others of them. But what bothers all of them is a teaching on which Jesus and Paul completely agreed, namely, that the kingdom of God was at hand. In first century texts, the kingdom of God is not a metaphor for heaven. It is not a coded way of talking about the church. In first century Judaism, the kingdom is an historical, empirical event. The defeat of pagan gods, the battle between good and evil, and good winning, the resurrection of the dead, the advent of the Messiah for those groups who expected a Messiah, the turning of the nations to Israel's God, the reassembling of Israel's 12 tribes, the establishment of universal peace. The day after the kingdom of God arrived, in other words, would definitely look different from the day before. John the baptizer in the 20s of the first century taught that these events were imminent. Jesus of Nazareth in the late 20s and early 30s of the first century taught that these events were imminent. And this is what Paul in the middle decades of the first century also taught was imminent. That's interesting. Because by the time that we have our earliest evidence for the Christ movement, that is to say with Paul's letters, mid-first century, the kingdom was already 20 years late. Today in Lund, on the 1st of June in 2017, the kingdom is almost 2,000 years late. And that is exactly what Christer says. This, too, took moral and intellectual courage because the delay of the end is something of an embarrassment. Indeed, in the 2,200 pages of those two most recent books on Paul as Christian theologian, or Paul as the founder of Christianity, their authors do not mention eschatology even once exegeting Paul in infinite and prolonged detail, they managed to neglect to mention that Paul expected the end of the normal world within his own lifetime. Perhaps they didn't notice. Perhaps it slipped their minds. Or perhaps they could not deal with it because the only way to turn Paul into a modern Protestant is to forget what he said about the impending return of Christ. Bad thinking and bad theology made Christer impatient. In final account, his last book on Romans, 1993, he observes, and I'm quoting him here, if the text says now, in the year 56 of the Common Era, where does that leave you and me? It leaves us almost 2,000 years later. No charismatic gamesmanship can overcome this simple fact. Just deal with it. Christa urges us, do not ignore it or pretend that it does not exist, but do not do bad history, which will lead to dishonest theology. Acknowledge that now is what Paul, mid-first century, proclaimed. Jewish eschatology matters for Christian theology 
not least because it and it alone accounts for the Christ movement's mission to pagans. It was only at the end, taught the prophet Isaiah, that the fullness of the pagans, all 70 nations descended from Noah, would turn to Israel's God. It was only at the end that the plenum of Israel, all 12 tribes, would recollect. It was only at the end that, quote, the fullness of the Gentiles and all Israel, as Paul says in Romans 11, would be redeemed. If we let go of Jewish eschatology, this embarrassing religious artifact from the Jewish past, we let go of the only thing that explains Christianity's future. Deal with it, said Christer. Think hard, but think. Why listen to him? Why not just ignore this embarrassment? Leave it out and write and read the most recent few thousand pages about the Protestant Paul. Again, Christer will have none of it. Such a retreat, he argued, betrays the Reformation. Here is Christer again on page 72 in Paul Among the Jews and Gentiles, and I quote him here. Our study has called us to recognize that when we are involved in reinterpretation, we should remember that we should, re- that we should interpret the original. We have lived with a sort of chain reaction, Augustine touching up Paul, Pelagius discussing and turning these things around, medievals pushing one way or another, and then further reactions moving away from the original. But the original is there. I have tried to point it out. The original is there, and to return to it is to be a true son or daughter of the Reformation. End of quote. If all of you go forth, resolve to learn Koine Greek from the theology faculty, I will consider you careful listeners of this lecture. But even if you do not so resolve, that's okay. There is no works righteousness here. But I end with the point that Christer's important article began with. Respect difference, please. Let ancient people be ancient people. Do not force them into a false role of modern people, no matter how important to you they are. Good 21st century theology is our responsibility, not theirs. And if they had not made sense to their own first century audiences, we would not be here together today. But we are here together today. So many years after Paul's lifetime, so few years after the Shoah, this time together matters. I would like to bless it then with a Jewish benediction. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ho'olom shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'higiyanu lazman hazeh. Thank you, Lord God, King of the Universe for allowing us to reach this moment. Thank you very much.